Cal, you're on. All right. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, uh, welcome to the monthly meeting. Happy New Year to everyone, and uh, welcome to the new shop. I'm sure most of you got to see it at the uh, Christmas party, or at least some of you. Kind of cool to see all the work is going on. So Chuck and his team and all of the volunteers, great job. Keep up the good work. I'm sure Chuck will give us an update here in a bit. Um, and welcome to those of you that may be watching on YouTube or on Facebook. So uh, we're we're kind of in the in the middle phase here. So with us as we as we. It, it seems to me that uh, Chris has done an amazing job getting us up for AV, and uh, without a lot of effort from me, I'm just here here. Uh, just want to give be thank give thanks out to all those who have put in so much work. Is that doing a lot of rustling? Do I need to move or something? That that I can do. Sound better? Okay. Um, do we have any uh, first-time visitors with us tonight? Look at that. Several. Great. Thank you guys for coming. And do, uh, do we have any people who have joined for the first time, the new members that just joined? Okay, all you visitors, next week, you, next month, you say, hey, I'm a new member. So you, hopefully you find that, that it will be worth worth it to come out. I think all of us would uh, still think we have a pretty, pretty amazing uh, group of group to be involved in. Um, and that, that also reminds me, if you haven't renewed, go ahead. I think uh, we'll, uh, we'll do a membership update tonight, but the renewals are, have been out. You still get a discount if you renew by the end of January. And, uh, I figure I could scold people about renewing since I just renewed about 15 minutes ago. So uh, um, go ahead and go ahead and do that. We're uh, we're excited to keep things rolling here in our new shop. New new shop. Um, as far as going down uh, the agenda, you guys know I like to move things pretty quick, so let's keep it moving. Um, as far as board member reports, Ron Hall, do you have anything uh, to report tonight? Nothing tonight. David? Roth? Nothing to report. Greg? Nothing to report. I like those updates. John Steyer? We're, uh, we're still paying our bills. We still have money in the bank. Uh, those, renewers, those renewals are definitely helping us with the, with the, cost, of the uh, cost of the new location. Um, Chuck, do you want to come up and give us a, a shop update? I know you've done a ton of work. You see, other than what you see, do you want to talk about the upcoming move? I think you probably should come up and wield the torch for a bit. They got to say nothing. How come I don't get this? Is it? <laughs> this is, uh, I, I've stopped by. There you go. I stopped by a couple of times. Um, but a lot of other people have really pitched in. Um, Tim Locke has been here most every day. Jim Bainey refuses to do any work and then does it. Um, so I don't know. He doesn't, he doesn't like the way screws go in, so he wants to redo them and I saw the to make him happy. I saw the electrical prefab shop. Jim Berard is getting all of our electrical work ready for the machinery hookups. Uh, Bill Lintner, if anybody remembers him from olden times, is running all the copper for our airlines. Um, there will be plenty more opportunities for you to join in. There's lots of painting and sanding and then we're going to move on uh, February 1st. And we will try and control the chaos. There's going to be a lot of stuff that can be moved if you've got a truck and trailer. We load up with tubs, bring it over here, unload it, go back, get more. Big stuff, we'll rent a truck that will line up to our dock and 
bring that stuff over. The idea plan will be ready for training on the 8th with their stuff up and running. Should be back to having open shops on the 10th of February. During that time from the 30th to the 10th, there will be no open shop. It will just be scurrying around. Um, we will then, once we get the shop up and running, and this is for Susan Lawler, we will worry about storage once we get the shop up and running. Everybody will have their stuff out on February 1st. Then we'll go in, we'll take the racks down, we'll move them over, set them up, and then we'll come and tell Susan there are this many spaces, start renting it out. I don't want to say anything now because if I get information that changes, your memory becomes crystal clear and unerring. <laughs> and you will come back to me and say, you told me that I would have this, and I don't have that. And I said, well, no, but I told you 17 times after that that it wouldn't be that. You told me, so we're not going to do that. We're going to play the game of you'll find out when, we're, when it's done. Um, keep an eye on your email. Uh, try to send stuff out. For the week, generally we're here 12 to 6, most days during the week. Um, it, you, you can't, I don't want to really encourage just showing up because there isn't always work for 20 people. Uh, I've asked for four every day and I've been running 6 to 12 every day. Um, if you show up and you're one of the six to 12 that didn't sign up, there may not be work, work to do. Um, some days there will be. Some days the work may not seem like fun, but we will keep going. We'll get done. We're, we don't have much time left. And uh, there's not too much more to do. But there is some. As I wanted to say, nothing from me. <laughs>
So thanks to everyone who came out for the uh, Christmas party. I think it was our largest attendance since I've been with the guild. And uh, just guys know in the works coming th up this fall, Lee Nielsen is coming back. They're planning on coming back. So, uh, and then with AV, uh, you guys like, comment, subscribe on YouTube, uh, and be sure if you guys have questions, go ahead and raise your hands for us so we can uh, get those. That way, people online can hear it as well. Okay, and great job on the Christmas party, Chris. And there were tons of people involved, but. Chris, you did an amazing job. It was uh, it was a great one. Um, do we have anything from uh, safety committee to talk about tonight? Kind of in the middle of the, uh, you know, the old shop closing down, new shop coming up. So I'm sure that will be a big bigger deal as we as we move forward. As far as membership, I already gave the plug out. Anything else you want to say? Okay, get those renewals in, and then if if you're a visitor, you know you might as well. No time like the present. You join now, you're good for the whole year. So, um, rough to ready. Any anything we need to talk about training or any setup? Any uh, anything set up right now for uh, classes or or rough to ready? Okay. Yeah, rough to ready schedule is available. Check out the check out the website. You can all you can also talk to John, watch your emails. And uh, anything, Kevin, from a training standpoint at this point. Okay. Um, and then, did we reschedule a skill builder? Is that going to be for February now? March. Okay. And I, that's still is that still going to be Tom? Carving a Newport shell. All right, that's going to be great. Um, okay, we're moving quite along. You guys know I like that. That makes me excited. Um, so the SIGs, I think most of the SIGs are are uh, are the SIGs on hold right now, or do the wood are the wood the hand tools and wood carvers and lasers and scroll saw and CNC? Is is anybody meeting here between now and the next meeting? CNC. Yes. Okay. So schedule still on for the wood carvers, which is the fourth Tuesday of the month. Hand tools is on schedule. Okay. Okay. So everybody's on. So I'm I'm completely uh, off base here. So let me just hand tools is the fourth Sunday of the month from two to four. So in case you don't know, our SIGs are our special interest groups. So people that are hand tool enthusiasts would meet uh, fourth Sunday of the month. You can find these schedules back at the at the website as well. Uh, wood carvers meet fourth Tuesday of the month from six to eight. And what, like Dan says, any type of carving you're interested in, whether it's hand carving, power carving, traditional carving, folk carving, anything you want to carve, they'll be able to help you with. If you just want to enjoy or learn or or you know work on some techniques or projects or anything like that. Uh, laser engravers the fourth Wednesday of the month at seven. Um, Scroll saw second Wednesday of the month at seven. That that's on schedule, George. Yes. Okay, great. And then uh, CNC third tu third Tuesday of the month from six thirty to seven thirty. So CNC on. Okay. Okay, CNC canceled. That's probably the one that I saw canceled, and then I jumped the gun on everybody else. So, okay, um, our next meeting will be here and our shop will be moved in. So that'll be a new experience with us. Uh, I'm really excited because we ran through that agenda and it's 714. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a record for me. Um, that's right. Don't say anything except for Chuck. Um, so now we'll do show and tell. Looks like we've got some nice, nice show and tell uh, groups. Our first show and tell at the, at the new location, Jim Bainey, come on up and lead the way. Okay, so, uh, okay, 
not used to being on stage. Oh. <laughs> My truck knows how to drive down here by itself. So I think uh, this is the third time today I've been here. There? Okay. So if you got a show and tell item, who's first? John? Big project here, John. Uh, this is a, I was looking for something for Christmas gifts, both for my, all my grandkids are teenagers now and then on the move. And so I made 13 of them for the adults and everybody in the family. But it's a pray for the things that uh, you need every day. And uh, I, uh, it's got an elliptical bottom, which I created by feeding a, with my 8-inch uh, box joint blade, feeding through at a 45-degree angle. On your table saw. On the table saw. Yeah. And then have the angled ends, uh, piecing it on. But I had this uh, free material, which was full inch and a half red oak that I just had to find a use for. And so it's uh, my favorite type of wood is free wood. <laughs> and it's uh, got Odie's oil for a finish. My first time of using Odie's oil. What'd you think of it? Great. You like it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, what I've found with Odie's is uh, if you let it set for a couple of days mm -hmm. and you go back and put another coat on it, mm -hmm. um, you get that waxy finish because um, the, the first coat tends to, especially with porous material like oak, um, it, it, it tends to soak in. Okay. And if you put a second coat on, you get that waxy it's more of a, 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 a softer finish okay. on, on it. And it's the same if you, you put it on for uh, 45 minutes to an hour and wipe it off and, and rub it out. Uh -huh. Works really good. Okay, because I did notice that this only has one coat and it's sort of rough. I mean, you can feel the roughness mm -hmm. in the work. Yeah, uh, the second coat might finish or might solve that. Okay. Good. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> so uh, um, you made 13 of these? Yeah. Um, I've made a batch since then for a fundraiser. So, How many total? I've made six more. Wow. Mm. I have free wood left. <laughs> okay, so um, what, what generally do people put in these? Like well, I thought what I had in mind was the things you need every day, like gofo, comb, pins. And then if it's down and it get lost in a larger drawer, and then the finger notches are for picking up the whole tray. So, Nice idea. Anyway. Very good. Any questions about this? This, this, this is pretty. I, I, I love the fact that you did this on a table saw. With, <laughs> yeah. Not a rated yeah. arm saw. <laughs> you, you probably wouldn't be living if no. you did it on a <laughs> radial arm so. saw. The blade is underneath on the table saw. <laughs> You'd be laying up at... KU Med Center. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Okay. Wow. These are, these are two screech owls. They're an eastern screech owl. There's two b birds in there. They're both sleeping, but if you look closely, the back one has its eye open. But uh, the interesting thing about little screech owls is they hide in real tight places, and they're polymorphic. Poly, that's an... an and what that means is that uh, it's the same bird, but they, some of them are gray, and some of them are called a rufous. It's a, a reddish-brown color. And it's just the way life is. But it's the same owl. It's just that some of them are different colors. And so I wanted to, to depict that. And this... Uh, the bark here is casted 
I have a casting mechanism, or a way of casting it. Uh, so it's, uh, then it's glued on. Then it's glued on, then it's glued on. Can you hear me now? Okay. But that's what it is. And uh, I get an idea in my head and I develop it and then it comes out and it starts off with a clay model and then it goes into the wood and then I kind of uh, uh, develop it as I move forward. But that's it. Did, did you make the tree trunk? Well, that's the tree trunk is cast. It's, a, it's cast with... Uh, it, it took a, a, a flexible mold from actual bark and then I cast it with... Uh, um, rock hard putty and then I paint it and then I put it back on so, so the, the screech owl is it indigenous to this area? no no this is I mean they're around here but it's really over on the uh, for the east okay but they're they, they're such a tiny owl and they like to hide together if you look on the internet for screech owls you'll see them uh in pairs, in real tight spaces, and they just hide. So it's not common to see them, but they're there. Hmm. And they mostly in holes and trees. Like yeah, in holes. Yeah, holes. that's where. Yeah. Yes, that's where they they hang out. Yeah. Hmm. So. How long did it take you to do this? Well, <laughs> uh, I start and I go as far as I can with what I have, and then I'll then I'll stop. And maybe it may set for two or three months until I, and I have several of them. I carve every day and I have several birds in, in process. I go as far as I can and then I stop and then I get the urge to go further. What else do you have in going right in progress right oh, now? Uh, I've got a peregrine fal falcon. I've got some, uh, uh, a couple of different types of hawks, um, some shorebirds. Got a pheasant? Uh, yeah, I do have pheasants. Really? Yeah, I got several pheasants. Need yeah. to talk to you about that. <laughs> okay. You come over and see me anytime you want. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Any questions about this project? Yes, sir. John? Uh, you said you cast that. The Durham's rock hard yes, water that's, Yes, that's all that is. Okay. It's got to be resupported, though. Yeah. I mean, there's a technique. And I'll be teaching a class down here uh, sometime th this coming year. I don't know when it'll all develop, but I'll be teaching a class on something. So, wow. any okay. other questions? How many how many cans of rock hard putty did this take? Uh, about a, just a half a can, something like that. Really? Yeah, it's, it's real thin. It's but it's got to be resupported underneath. It's not heavy. Hmm. And then there's a ways of attaching it. it. They're put together like a piece of a puzzle. And then there's a way of painting it, and then it's a process, but Great. it works Very out. Very good. Okay. Any, any other questions? No. Yep. Yes. Are, are those oils that you use on that rock hard Is putty? Oil paint? Oh, no. No, no, no. That, the oil, bird. Oil paint. The bird, I, I teach and paint in oil. The birds are painted in oil, but on that rock hard putty, that is the cheapest uh, acrylic paint I can find. Okay, okay cause it's, and it's, you'll go through it. But that, that's acrylic. So. Why, why is, are you looking because, for the cheapest product that you can find? Because um, you, uh, I don't want a universal color. I don't want the colors to be perfect. I, want it, I, I have a, a process where I paint it and I spray it with, uh, a mist of water and it runs off and I need to have it run off and that's what cheap paints do they do run off they did you hear yeah. that Chuck <laughs> <laughs> so anyway that's a, that's the way it is okay okay very good all right um, that was worth it <laughs> Thanks for bringing that in. Any other questions? Thank you. Nice project. Wow. Comes from a favorite Scandahoovian. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. This is just a project for the shop. Uh, I've got a bunch of tools that I've had squirreled away down in drawers and I find I never take them out and I'd like to use them more. So this was basically to uh, go ahead and, and get some space on the wall in the shop. So that's it. Just uh, dovetail through tenons, Morrison tenons, a little inlay on the side and that's it. <laughs> Okay, so you made this out of cherry? Cherry, yeah. What, what, do you, what tools do you put in there? Uh, block planes, small router planes, uh, wooden plane, plane. shoulder plane. <laughs> okay, um, there's a penny um, countersunk in the back. Yes, that's the, the year. Oh. The year it was made. Okay. And then... You just couldn't write it on? No, nah, that's no fun. Okay, and is it French <laughs> cleat on? Yeah. Cleated on the wall? Yep. So. And what'd you finish it with? Oh, it is oil. Awesome! <laughs> so, it, with the way you've been selling that, I had to try it. I don't know if I'll keep using it or not. So, what, what, it's okay. what, what did you like about it, Odie's oil? What didn't you <laughs> like about it? I don't know that I like the application. I don't like the, uh, it's, a, it's such a, a pasty, nasty thing to, to get spread out. It just seems others are better and easier to use and so. It, but it, I, I'm very happy with how it turned out. So okay. I, I sanded down to a thousand and it, it turned out pretty nice, so. Pretty good. Yeah, that's yeah. an awesome finish. So, uh, I don't have anything against Odie's oil. I just don't know if it's going to be one of my favorites. Okay. So, you're you're big into into shellac, right? Shellac and wax are mm -hmm. are kind of my go-to uh, where it's appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Any questions about this toolbox with the penny in the back? Yeah. I see, I see That's an inlay on the side. Is there a significance to the inlay? Good question. I, I saw it and I liked it, so I made it. <laughs> that, I mean, really, that's, that's about it. I think one of the, uh, Jamil, I think, Benchcrafted, posted, posted that design one time, and I looked at it and thought that was going to be fun to make. And, it was fun to make, and it's pretty easy to inlay too. So, other question I have: What are the what are the major challenges with the tenons being proud? All the dovetails and the tenons being proud. We were talking earlier about how, to me, that would seem like a ton of extra work. It's 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 a little tricky. You have to always have the ends done. You can do sanding of the the final end grain, uh, but you've got to have the ends pretty much done when you when you put it in and glue it up you know so yeah i, I would struggle with that because i need the hand plane beating them up to close all my gaps <laughs> yeah you don't you don't get that <laughs> don't get that chance do you recall what size drill bit you used to flush mount that penny uh three quarter inch okay yeah i had a real hard time finding a 2023 penny i went to the <laughs> bank and i asked for a roll of brand new 2023 pennies and she looked at me like I was nutty. I said, <laughs> do you have a single 2023 penny? And she says, she looked in her drawer and she says, no, I don't see one. So I found one by accident. But <laughs> I'm going to do the same thing. I, I watch them, watch and change. Usually takes a few months to find one. Well, we don't carry coins anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I mean, that's, have to, go to, have to go to nickels or quarters or something. I don't know. So, yeah. huh. any other questions? Very good. Thank you. Awesome project.
Hi, Steve. Since yesterday. Where, where were you today? I was at work. Okay. So this is, uh, I helped Dave Kratz a little bit uh, teaching his beginning hand tool woodworking. And I decided if I was going to help teach, I better learn what I was teaching. So uh, they do a, a shaker bench in that class, uh, all hand tool joints. Uh, it's finished a little nicer with nice round ends and nice parallel sides, but my daughter doesn't like that kind of look. So, so what's the piece of wood that you, what kind of wood is this? This is walnut. walnut. And it's a slab I had left over from her table. I had one slab left. So the, the bandsaw marks on top of it are original. Uh, I did have to straighten out the back so I could do some measuring and marking. And then I took a gouge and a chisel and a hand plane to it and beat it up a little bit before I put Odie's on it. So, um, you... Those are half laps. Half laps. And then the, the legs are wedged mortises into the seat. And she doesn't like it. She doesn't like it plain, flat, smooth. She likes rough. Oh, she does like oh, this. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. I misunderstood no, you. No, no. Well, if she didn't like it, I know where you can get rid of it. <laughs> Very good. So. so wow. I, I, I like the simplicity and I like the rusticness of it. That's, that's really. Well, that's the, the classic shaker style bench. Just uh, my version of it, I guess. So. How did you cut those? The, are original bandsaw marks. No, the, I'm talking about the oh, the dove, the, the, joint? the, the, the dovetails are the these joints right here. How did you cut that, get that really good and tight? Well, this one I cheated. I had it's a little wider, so I had to put a fix it plug in it. Okay, uh, the other ones uh, you what was the process that you used to cut these square? Holes. You mark them out on both sides, drill a whole couple of holes through them, and and uh, chisel them out. So th these were hand chiseled out yeah. to get them to that. Wow. And there and there's a wedge in here. These are wedged together, so they won't come apart. Very good. And you got and you finished with the Odies. Odies, one coat, not two yet. Okay. I I, I recommend two. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm on. I'm on retainer with them. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it tomorrow, and you can put it on. I love putting that stuff on. I, I, yeah, I, I, it's really good for your hands. Well. You, always, you know, and when you're putting it on, my wife will walk out in the shop. She says, "Oh, that really smells good. It smells better than that burnt wood that you do when you put it through the table saw." So, yeah. Yeah. Any questions, for Steve, with his bench? Thanks for bringing that in. One more. Okay, Neil. Tell us about this uh, prehistoric Circular saw. Didn't take a great deal of talent for me to come up with it, but, okay, in olden times, and don't ask me what it is, I haven't looked up the patent date on it, but how would you cut a hole in the floor? Right? And people go, oh, well, you drill it out, and then you go after it with a keyhole saw, and you widen it. Okay, if you don't want to do that and you don't have the circular saw, with this, you saw 
will eventually, because of the curve, you end up with a notch. And when that goes through your floor, when that, sorry, when that goes through your floor, you come up on the tip, you'll notice we got teeth on both sides, and then you can go to town and it cuts really fast, right, versus anything else at the time. Obviously, a circular saw works better if you happen to have one. But although they're around, you don't find them around very often, and I really don't know why as many carpenters as has to have been around. Apparently, not everybody had one. Because I've only seen a couple of them. I've been a carpenter for 45 years. This is the first time I've ever seen one. <laughs> So, nice idea, though. I, I can see where, yeah, it would, it would, it would work. And the fun thing about it, take that in your right hand, okay, and then take it in your left hand, and tell me how, what percentage of people are right-handed and what are left-handed, because it feels terrible in your left hand when you wrap your finger around that. It's tight. It's a sharp deal. And you go the other way. Oh, yeah, I can see. It's got a bias on it. Yeah. Hmm. So, kind of different. Anyway, take a look at it. It'll be over there. Hey, uh, it'll work better if you put a coat of Odie's oil on it. <laughs> Probably would, except I normally just use Johnson's floor wax. But Okay. That'll it, work. Anyway, thank any you. questions? Okay, thank you. All right, nice job. Thanks everybody for bringing those projects in. And uh, next month, please, if you got projects, bring them in. Love to see. I think, to me, uh, that's definitely one of the highlights of our our, our uh, monthly meeting, seeing what you all are working on. So, we're going to take a quick break before we come back with Buck Arnold, uh, who's an artist, who's Fred's brother, and he's going to show us his work. Before that, make sure you go see Dwayne. We've got raffles over there. We've got how many how many things over there? Eight, eight, eight things to, you can go uh, put uh, put tickets in, buy tickets, uh, got snacks. Usually, Chris, what do you say? About eight minutes from now, we'll we'll reconvene. All right, thanks. Hi. My name is Mike Jones and welcome to another episode of the Kansas City Woodworkers Guild's ongoing series of machine safety videos. Today's video will introduce you to the safety rules and requirements of the Powermatic hollow chisel mortiser. Keep in mind that like all safety videos, this video only covers the safety concerns of this machine and is not a complete training program for the use of this equipment. When in the shop, please direct any questions about using this or other machines to the on-duty shop foreman. He or she is there to act as your main resource in helping you to keep safe and provide advice in assisting you to successfully complete your project. Always remember, the most important of safety concerns is to wear approved safety glasses with side shields at all times while in the KCWG shop. Your regular glasses are not approved for use when participating in any shop activity while you are at the guild. Hollow chisel mortisers are used to cut square or rectangular holes in wood, generally for the mortise side of a mortise and tenon joint. The hollow chisel mortiser is equipped with a square chisel with a rotating auger bit within the chisel that serves to remove large amounts of material while the chisel cuts a square or rectangular hole, leaving the square corners and smooth walls of the mortise. Hollow chisel mortisers are similar to a drill press in that the mortiser combines the square chisel 
with the rotating drill bit in the center. The bit inside the chisel clears out most of the material while the chisel ensures that the hole is clean, square, and smooth inside. When using the hollow chisel mortiser, one must first install the proper size chisel. The Kansas City Woodworkers Guild has a selection of mortising chisels sized from one quarter inch to three quarter inch. The mounting of the chisel and bit requires that you mount the chisel into the collet while inserting the bit shank into the chuck. The chuck is identical to one used in a drill press. It is best to use a piece of scrap stock to hold the chisel and bit in place while you tighten the chuck with the available chuck key. Once the bit is securely mounted in the chuck, you then loosen the collet holding the chisel and raise the chisel about one sixteenth of an inch and then retighten the collet screw. It is recommended that you then turn the chuck by hand one complete turn to ensure that nothing is binding. There are stop screws that allow you to set limits on the side to side and front to back travel of the bed. If you're not familiar with the setup procedure, Please ask the foreman on duty to help you with this procedure. It's very important to remember to have your stock securely clamped into position before turning on the machine and cutting your mortises. When cutting through mortises, please be sure to have a piece of sacrifice material under your work so that you don't risk cutting into the machine bed. Another important thing to remember when using the hollow chisel mortiser is at the position of the waste port on the chisel. You will want to mount the chisel so that the waste port is leaving the waste behind in the previously cut hole. This helps to allow the waste material to not build up inside the chisel and generate friction heat which will dull the chisel and the bit prematurely. Please ask the shop foreman for assistance if you're not sure how to set this up. It is also a really good idea to check the chisel and bit for sharpness before you start. A dull chisel can make things a lot more difficult and affect the quality of your mortise. Please ask the foreman to help you with sharpening the chisel if you're not familiar with how to do it. When you start the machine, be sure to never touch the chisel with the bit spinning. You should never allow your hands or fingers to be closer than three inches from the chisel when cutting your mortise. The auger is exposed on the side of the chisel where the waste port is located and can cause severe injury should you touch it. Remember, when cutting your mortises, the bit and chisel, ideally, should be fully engaged. Cut your first hole then move the bed about two-thirds the size of the next hole to make the next cut. This puts less strain on the bit and eliminates the deflection of the chisel and bit and the high level of heat that can be generated by the deflection. Following this procedure will produce a cleaner cut and more professional looking result. Also, never try to hand hold the piece you're cutting. Your stock should be firmly clamped in the machine before you turn the mortiser on. Remember, the successful use of the hollow chisel mortiser is very dependent upon a good setup, especially when performing several repeat cuts on table or chair legs. When you're finished, you should take a few moments to check your work area, clean up the machine and the floor around where you've been working. This is Mike Jones. Thanks for watching.
Sandpaper. Sandpaper rolls. The last three numbers are eight, two, eight. For the smaller version, the last three numbers are eight, oh, seven. For the what is it? hinges. Hinge set. Hinge set. The last hinge. The for they're cutting out. She's trying. Numbers eight five three, last raffle number. Eight three nine, that's the next one. All right, Cal, we're live. Everyone, we're gonna get going and let's go ahead and find your seats. Let's uh, move on to the program portion of our, uh, our meeting. So uh, this, is, this is Buck Arnold. He's our member, Fred Arnold. Who, Fred did a presentation on uh, drawing about a la in the last year, drawing faces, and he's involved in our carvers. So Buck is an artist that is his brother. I don't know a ton about you, so I'm going to let you introduce yourself, but thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to sit down so I can uh, run this thing. Uh, I started uh, drawing when I was uh, five years old, and uh, Fred's about 10 years older than I am, and he was carving back then, so he would have been 15, and he was draw uh, carving a kite cell out of the, and it was in an encyclopedia, he had a picture. And it was only about that big, and uh, I was a little kid, and uh, I picked up a piece of paper and I started drawing, and that's where it started. And uh, you know, a lot of people always go, when you do stuff, they go, "Oh, you got talent," you know. But talent's all about: uh, do you push it? Do you practice? Do you do all that stuff? And Fred. Fred and I both have uh, two grandpas that were pretty artistic. One of them was kind of an inventor, which I think Fred got a lot out of. And like when I was a little kid, he was making army guns for us and tanks. And, and he made a big tank one time. We had a block fight, you know, with rocks and all that stuff. And, tent, and then he made uh, army guns and they'd shoot bullets and all this stuff. And, uh, and then when I started doing this, this uh, horse, uh, my dad started telling me stories about my grandpa Arnold who would paint horse heads on uh, the barn doors, you know, the, gray, the grain door up on top. And so that kind of propelled me to keep going and stuff because, you know, I had a family member that was doing stuff. And so um, I started at five and uh, I was lucky I got to live my dream. I was wanted to be an artist from then on, and uh, I retired as one, <laughs> and uh, I, that's all I did my whole life. That's the only thing I ever did, except in college I was working in a restaurant to get through. So, uh, like I said, I uh, so I started drawing and I started doing stuff in grade school, and I'll start out here, and this is uh, my mom saved all my pictures. And this is from first grade. And, uh, and then this one is from second. And this is from second grade also. And, and uh, I was lucky I had a lot of teachers that were really good. And they would, they would uh, encourage me and stuff as it went along. Until I got to eight, uh, seventh grade, I went to a junior high. And at that time, you couldn't take art. Just girls could. So we go to mechanical drawing, and the teacher says, art's for sissies, men take mechanical drawing. So I go, well, if I keep doing art, I'm gonna get beat up. So I started lifting weights and stuff, and then I started doing sports, and so when I got into high school, I did three sports, and I was lucky enough to uh, get a scholarship to play football, and I played football at Fort Hayes, and I majored in art. And so when I got done, uh, with my bachelor's, my advisor said, 
you should apply for the master's degree and we'll give you an assistantship probably. You know, you'll probably get one. So they gave me, this is back in the 70s, they gave me $2,000 a year <laughs> and I taught a, a appreciation art class. And so I got my MA and then later on they came up with an MFA and I got that on an assistantship. So they paid for that one too. So I kept going. So then I, I, uh, I, uh, you're always asked to do signs when you're in art. And so I'd do them, but I never liked how I was doing them because I didn't know what I was doing. You know, they never looked quite right. Until one day I was walking down Main Street and I turned the corner and there's a sign painter and he was painting up there and I started talking to him and he kind of hooked up with me and uh, taught me a bunch of tricks. And I started doing signs and murals and stuff like that. And I went off on my own and, uh, and it went from there. And so I'll, I'll, I'll start showing you some of the other stuff. So Kennedy died in sixth grade. Uh, that's when he was assassinated. So Life Magazine, I don't know if you all remember, they had all these pictures of him and stuff. So I was in this class and there was a bunch of boys and we all could draw. And we were always drawing Kennedy's because we had these Life Magazines and stuff. And so I, I took this one that I had a paint by number set. I'd always get them for Christmas, but I would never finish them. And uh, so I, I took this piece of paper one night and I used my paint by number paints and painted this and I took it to school the next day and the nun put it out in the hallway so that was my first big success. So then after uh, college uh, I started my sign business and I'll show you some stuff I did in Hayes. I used to do a lot of race cars, uh, pulling trucks, uh, you name it, all kinds of signs. So I, I did design this and I did all the lettering on it. And these are a couple of, and I did the sign in the back, in the background there too, the Raiders, pedal pushers, plus the car. And I was working at this uh, restaurant during college and this, and this uh, gal that was working there, her dad worked for this seed company down in Healy, Kansas. Probably most of you never heard of that place. It's down by Scott City. And they, and they were Buffalo brand seed. And so they, they had this trailer, they take it to a three eye show, and I don't know if anybody remembers what that was out in Salina. And so there's a, the display on the inside, and they go in one door and come out the other one. So I got commissioned to do this, and then my advisor in college uh, got it permission to put this on the campus in one of the vacant lots, and I got to paint it while school was on, and kids would walk by and see me doing it and stuff. Here's the other side of it. And back then, I didn't know really what I was doing. And this thing took me about a year and a half, two years. And I could probably do it in about three weeks now. Uh, so I was looking at Outside Magazine one day, and they always had that parting shot on the last page. And this picture was on there. So you can see the truck pulling it in front there, and it was setting just right. And I looked at it, and I go, that's that trailer I did. <laughs> and then they had it, they had it with that healed just right, and uh, I thought that was kind of cool. Okay, here's a couple, I used to etch glass too. Uh, like I said, I did everything, anything to make money. And this was in Hayes, and I learned how to etch glass. Uh, and these were done, this one, the, the one on the left was done on location. The other one I did in my shop, and, and that, was, that was always a lot of fun. I did, I did big trucks. Uh, this was done with Emron paint. I don't know if anybody here ever painted with Emron. It would about kill you if you didn't have a mask on. I mean, it was terrible stuff. And, uh, but I had to get something with hook to aluminum. Uh, here's another etched glass. I did a, I did a bunch of bars. Uh, this particular bar, uh, there's another shot of it. This one's 10 foot by four foot, and it was behind the bar. Uh, I think I had 25 mirrors in there that I etched and uh, painted. Here's a mural that's in Fort Hayes in the library that I did back in the 80s. And this is a place uh, south of town. And it's the biggest hill around, which is real flat out there. And they called it Blue Lady Hill. And there's Fort Hayes was out there, which was made famous by Dance with Wolves. And supposedly there was a ghost out there who was a nurse for the army 
and they call it Blue Lady Hill. So that's looking down at the sunrise. And then this is when I moved to Kansas City. I went to work for Acme Sign, who's no longer, they went, uh, they closed it down and stuff. But we were right across, we were right over here, right across from uh, Boulevard Brewing. In fact, the tap room was Acme Sign back then. And uh, I, I painted all kinds of stuff. I painted around the building and I did all the logos. I painted the vans before vinyl became popular. And this is the, the smokestack, which is what they made for a tap rod later on. And I got to paint that thing. And, and then uh, when I came down here, I was here six months before my, my family came because they were finishing school out. I came in December. And Bo Jackson was still hot. And I did some Bo Jacksons. And I, and I took my son to a card show one time when he came down. He was like fourth grade then. And... Uh, I traded this uh, uh, dealer, uh, Bo Jackson painting for some cards for my son. He wanted these rookie cards. So this guy calls me up and he says, I know, I know Derek Thomas, and uh, would you be interested in doing some so stuff in a restaurant for him? Well, that never developed, but Neil Smith had, a, had another banner that was really, real childishly done. And I didn't want for Derek which is his top one, and Neil said, who did that? And, and so then I got, Neil says, he got a hold of me, and I got to do his, and then the uh, PR gal, uh, I did him from then on for like the 18 years or so that uh, Carl Peterson was there. And then there, I, I kept doing sports art in this, I knew a couple guys that could get stuff signed for me, and so my son was, uh, the, I think the first one I got him was a, happy 14th birthday and it was uh, Joe Montana or Neil Smith or something and I and this guy could get me all these different ones this one's uh happy 20 23rd birthday you know so I, I kept doing these and I got him from 14 to 23 and it was all kind of different sports guys here's a uh, uh, Marcus Allen that's about this big and that's a uh, it's actually uh airbrush acrylic and colored pencil is how I did those. Neil Smith, and that's about, about this big, and uh, that's, that's done the same technique. There's some airbrush in it, but I, I really like, I was always real picky about if it doesn't look right, I'm not going to show it. <laughs> Here's another Neil Smith. This one was actually a takeoff from a Batman poster. And I saw this Batman poster where he was kind of looming and had this black background. And I, I had this picture of Neil like that. And I thought, hey, that's going to be pretty cool. And I, so I did that one. And then this guy talked me into painting um, footballs, the white, the white autographed ones. And, and these are some white autographed ones. And so it doesn't have that rough texture on it. It's kind of that smooth uh, white doe skin. Here's another one, uh, Ray Nischke. And this just shows a little bit of the, uh, my sign capabilities. Uh, this is in a, in a mechanic shop. I traded these guys. I always used to like, used to like to barter. And uh, I traded them. I did a bunch of NASCAR stuff in their waiting room. And I traded them for working on my truck. <laughs> okay. And then... After Acme Sign, I went to work for Associated Grocers, who is a, a co-op, and they're here in Kansas City, and they're in 22 states, and I think they're in more now. We had like 10 warehouses, and uh, so we had stores all over. The stores in Kansas City are Price Choppers and uh, Country Marts and stuff like that, and all the McKeevers and uh, uh, Cosentinos are the ones I did. So this is in a price chopper on Woodland in K-10. So the, the gal with the overalls on in the middle with the hat, that's my wife. And then the girl next to her, that's my daughter-in-law. And then the and then guy in the black shirt is the produce manager. And I'd have, these, I'd have these guys ask me, okay, and the guy in the yellow is the wrangler. He would go to all the stores and check the produce. So I would get these guys like the 
that worked at the store or construction guys, and they would want me to put them in a mural. And so they'd, like, they'd give me beer or stuff like that. <laughs> uh, and some of these are uh, my son and myself modeling, and then I'd change our, you know, how we looked and stuff. I'd put mustaches on us or something. And, and I always pride myself in having the trucks have the right perspective. Okay, this is in the Costantino's down here across the street from Midland. Uh, I can't remember what street that is. Uh, the Midland Theater, it's right across the street. And this, is, this goes up the staircase. That big, the big long one is uh, 16 foot. And this is in the ceiling, uh, these next ones. And the reason we did those in the ceiling was Costantino's uh, grandpa uh, painted murals in churches for a while. And, and uh, so they wanted to do a tribute to him but it was in the liquor department. <laughs> and there's a kind of shot of it. And, and these, okay, so these were done in the shop, small, like 17 inches and then however long, and then they would take them and they'd scan them and they could make them into wallpaper. So I didn't actually paint those in, in person. And then this one, those are all wallpaper, and so is all these. I didn't paint these in I didn't paint these at the place. They were probably about this big, all these. Okay. And this is down in a big store in uh, Oklahoma City uh, on the road that goes to Norman. And this store is like bigger than anything in Kansas City. It was so big they had two front doors to it and everything. And so I did all these, all these murals. And this is all wallpaper. And uh, they wanted that sepia color on it to give it an age. Then this is the dairy, and uh, I'll show you a few pictures of this. And it's actually like uh, 200 and some foot complete. So when I did it, it was probably 17 inches by 50 some foot. You know, and so I'd have this roll of canvas, and I'd have to roll it up all the time and move it around and stuff. And this is probably 15 foot tall at the store, because those, uh, those doors underneath are eight footers. There's not a shot of it. Okay, and then this is in the uh, produce. A popular thing that we always did was we tried to make it look like a roadside market so that you had that, that authentic or farm type feel to it and all that stuff. So this one's, this one's probably 130 some foot. And so I had to, I had to come up with all this stuff and uh, I, would, I would do drawings in pencil and then we'd show that, the designer would show the uh, owner and then they'd approve it and then I'd start painting it and then they'd take down pictures of it and stuff and see if they liked it and all that. See, this is, this is probably 15 foot tall also. There's a close up of it. And some of the people in here are guys in the shop and other people I know. And then some of it's just from photographs I found of people. Uh, the bottom part on this, where it says rotisserie chicken and stuff, that's tile that they could scan. They could take my, my pastels or my paintings and, and, and put it on the tile because in the, in the meat department and the deli department, it had to be able to be wiped off or, you know, cleaned. And then the top stuff is wallpaper with the chicken and all that stuff. Okay, now, um, this, this is that, still that store in Oklahoma City. And this guy was an ace pilot in World War II. And he got out of the Army, or the Air Force, I mean. And his first truck was this uh, Diamond T. And this is the particular year he had. So he wanted this truck on the side of that, or you know, in that one part of it. And so the wheels on this are actually 13 inch, so we could scale it down. And then the cab is carved out of foam, which I, I, I carved a lot of stuff out of foam after a while. And I carved chef's hats and stuff like that. 
and uh, so that the cab's all carved out of foam, and then the hubcaps, uh, they're, they're actually foam, and then I airbrushed them so they look like they're chrome. And then I did the lettering on it, too. That's the, the one on the left is, uh, is tile also, and then the one on the right is painted on brick, and then they wanted it aged, so, you know, I, I could, like, brush it, and I'd put, use different colors, and I might sand it a little bit, too, to give it a little more aged look to it. This is in the meat department, that's all tile. And they wanted it all in black and white in that one, which looked pretty good, I think. Okay, here's a typical produce uh, uh, wall. And this is uh, also um, wallpaper. Okay, so here, so an owner, some of these owners would have Costantino's have 25 stores. Some other owners would have 10, 5, something like that. So they might want to use the same images, but they were able to manipulate them, make them bigger or smaller, however they needed. So this one was the same owner. So then it was in, used in another store, and so there's this little added part to it, but it was, the same as, it was the same as this one. But we just added that other little part, and then they stretched it out and stuff. And then there's a... Let's see, that one on top, I think, is in Odessa, or it was, if that store is still open. And I can't remember where the bottom one was. There's another produce. And then I think that's my son. Uh, that's me in the red. <laughs> and I put a beard on and stuff. And then, uh, I think that's one of the gals that worked at the shop. This one's in uh, Branson, and they wanted a mural to show different things that happen in Branson. So I had the ukulele, Elvis, uh, downtown, the train and all that, Silver Dollar City. This is a tile one. And I also did the letters up on top that says delicatessen. And the background is all tile. This one's tile. This one's really cool in, in person. Uh, it really got a cool color. It's, it's hard to, uh, when you start thinking about a steak, and what color is it? <laughs> and you're trying to mix colors to make that, that particular color. And that, was, that was a big challenge. Here's another tile one. Okay, this is my carving endeavors. So the guy, both these guys standing by are probably 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, so that's probably a 12-foot long steak. And that's carved out of foam. So then we shot uh, drive it on it, which they put on the stucco buildings. And then uh, we painted it, or I painted it. I'd carve it with a butcher knife. I had a sawzall with a big saw blade on it. Uh, I used a grinder. And I'd come home, I'd have, I'd have foam in my ears and my pockets and, I mean, all over. It was, it was a mess. This one is uh, 28 foot long. This is in that Crest store down in uh, Oklahoma City. That stake, or that T-bone's about eight foot long. The whole thing's 28 foot. And then he wanted it, he wanted it to slant so it looked down at you. So that made another problem out of it. And they'd bring in these chunks of foam and they'd be uh, six, see, six foot tall and four foot deep and 10 foot long. This is another one that's down there. There's a, I don't know what store that's in. <clears throat> that's probably uh, eight or nine feet tall. Big apple one, it's probably like, probably about that big on the floor. Piece of cheese. And I always had to figure out the colors for it and all that stuff. This is in that Crest store in the, in the hallway when you, when you first come in and their big, their big logo was home of rock bottom. So I, I carved all the rocks, and then I had to make the truck, but I only had uh, three foot depth to show the, the perspective of it. So I had to do all kind of drawings so I, got that, so I got that bed looking right. So it looked like it was actually 3D. And then after we put it up there, we broke the wall and, and had the different stuff hanging out, and I had to put all the cracks and stuff like that. This is in a, uh, 
I did a lot of liquor murals in the Missouri stores and in other towns. Um, this is in uh, Kearney. And so Jesse James is from Kearney. And so I got his picture on there and there was Jesse James bourbon and then that from that full throttle saloon. Okay, and then I did a trick to it in the picture of his house is crooked and that was always a kind of a um, a trick to see if anybody knew what that meant. And I don't know if anybody does. That's why that's why he was shot in the back because he got on a chair to straighten a painting and Ford shot him in the head. So I put that I put that put the uh, picture of the house crooked, and uh, one of the guys putting the stuff up he caught it right away. <laughs> Okay, this is this is part of the this was a 113 foot mural of uh, and this is all hand painted on the wall, on location, and these uh, liquor these wine bottles are nine foot tall. And the guy gave me uh, 25 bottles and he said, see how many of these you can get on there and here's the order uh, of importance. So that's that shows you uh, two of the walls and then. There's part of that one and over and then it, it was like three different walls and you can see the Jesse James part of it. This one's down in Branson and uh, I did a Budweiser uh, in a liquor area. And the surprising thing about it was Budweiser never uh, proved it if it, was, if it met their standards or not. And uh, I thought that was kind of weird. And it has, it has the horses running over in one other spot too. I didn't bring that. I can't remember where this one's at. I've always liked doing people. Um, so that's always been my big my big thing. People and horses. This is in a, a store in Manhattan. This is on brick. I painted it on location. And these are a couple of small ones. And uh, I was trying to, on the produce one, I was trying to make it look like uh, linoleum, the background, and have all kind of different colors swaying around it and stuff and on the meat part also. Okay, and then I, uh, my wife was a teacher, so um, it started in Hayes. I, I did some uh, grade schools in the high school and stuff. I did, I did their logos, and then when we came down here, I did a school that she was teaching in, and then the guy that was the reading teacher became a principal, and he called me up, and I went to his school and did his school, and then this was, a, this was a, 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 one of the second schools he got, and my wife taught there, too. That's from around 2000. Here's another one. The dogs are about six foot tall. That's about uh, 30 or 40 foot long, and that's hand-painted on location. This is on the stage doors, uh, so it'd be 10 foot by 25. This one's uh, eight foot by 40. And uh, the, background, the background on it, I studied Pixar movies, uh, stills to get the colors, how to get the depth in it and stuff. And my wife had a teacher that she taught with uh, in last year, uh, at 55, she had a heart attack and died, and so they, they did a memorial to her. And this is one of the pictures of it. And so she had a gumball machine, and she would give them presents, and so I had, they had me come up with some ideas for it. And I had the gumballs flying out, and then the third grade would always do monarch butterflies, and so they turned into butterflies. And then in, that dark, in the dark blue up here, her name was Stortz. She always called her kids Stortz of Stars. And in the fifth grade, uh, added as a legacy gift, and they donated some of the money that paid for it. This is another school I did. The stud horse in the middle is about five foot tall. This was a real fun school. And when you come in the front door, this, this mural is uh, probably 50, 60 feet, so you really get a good view of it. And this is a school I did uh, last year. And that's probably uh, eight by 20, I think. And this particular school, he wanted me to come up with a different cardinal. And they, 
either a parent did it or somebody else, and he he asked, he had a poll, and he says, "Who? what's our mascot? And the kids all thought it was a chicken. So he said, you need to come up with a good cardinal for me. And so this was part of it. Okay, so <clears throat> the numbers on it, uh, that's a growth chart. So the kids come in every year, and they take a picture of the first first part of school and so they're there for five years or so and then you see how big they get with the numbers next to them and stuff and I've done I've probably done about 20 of those in different schools this is the entryway and that other one was too so that's the cardinals I came up with and the other funny thing was the guy I said what do you want to say on it and he said you come up with something and so that was kind of fun that he challenged me to. That always makes it more fun when he, when he, when they let you do what you want to do or try to. And this one also, he's. I did that last summer, and I said, "What do you want to do on that one?" And he says, "Give me some ideas." And so I thought it'd be kind of cool. It's a grade school, and they start from uh, preschool on. So I thought, you know, they learn how to fly, <laughs> being a cardinal and stuff. So I thought it's kind of cool having them run, and then all of a sudden they can fly. And uh, that's in a stage door and. Uh, and those doors open up too. And that's in the gym. I also did that in the summer. That's uh, 40 foot, and the cardinal is eight foot tall. Okay, this is in a school uh, my grandson goes to, and it's called Sunflower Elementary. But their, low, their mascot is cyclones. So they said, what am I gonna do with that? So they, I try to make it look like there was a cyclone going on, and I got that's why all the leaves are blowing around and the dark skies and stuff. And this one's about 19 foot by nine, I think. This one was a fun one too. This is uh, they do some deal called uh, uh, Leader and Me, and so it it has something about dark to light, and then it has the Leader and Me logo thing or uh, points of interest. And this one's uh, 50 foot by uh, 10 and it was real fun trying to do all the different uh, foliage and stuff and like okay so I did this I did this I usually do these school ones I can usually do one in a week so uh, this one took like five six days this one took about that long too and he's about seven foot the coyote it's it's fun to uh, come up with the different colors and stuff to make it work, and then you kind of use some of the school colors, which was purple, and and then I used other ones to make it accent it. And this is in a junior high in Wyandot, <coughs> and uh, there's three of them, and they're all 19 foot by nine. And I started I started on a Monday, and I was loaded up on Friday by 2.30, and I had all three of them done, and they were in different staircases, and I had to carry my ladders around and stuff, and it was a, it's a big junior high. This is another one, and this is another school where they said, I just had one of these drawings done, and I said, what do you want to do in the other two, and they said, you come up with it, and so that was, my wife helped me on that. That's another one. And it was a you know a junior high and stuff, and so I was trying to make it kind of uh, youthful with the lettering and stuff. This is a real fun one I did this last year, uh, and it's it's in uh, uh, Shawnee Mission, and this is uh, 25 feet by 14. So that tree that tree is you know almost 14 foot tall. And so I was taking my brush and I was making all those all those leaves, <laughs> and and that, it was a really a fun one to do. And then I I every time I'd drive over there, I'd I'd look at the weeds and the stuff in the in the ditches and the stuff, and stop and take pictures sometimes. So I had all the different Kansas uh, uh, weeds and stuff in there. And their logo or their mascot is the fox. So there's there's you can see three of them, and then there's two or three hidden in the sunflowers. Then there's an adult back in that left side. So then on the way on the right side, there's a buffaloes. And so they wanted to show their feeder schools. And so that's a Shawnee Mission North, who's the buffaloes. And then the hawks or the eagles are the junior high that they're gonna go to. 
So that's why the eagles and the buffalo are in there. And the front fox is probably this, probably this big. The eagles, you know, about that big too. This is a fun school too. Uh, there's no place like Brome, and there are the panthers. So that's why it's a panther. So I use the Wizard of Oz, and she liked the the principal liked the Wizard of Oz stuff. Uh, and this is one I just did uh, this fall, and uh, it was a lot of fun doing that one. Then I went on a mission trip one time to El Salvador, and uh, I think it was there six days, seven days, and uh, so I painted the three pictures in the back plus that uh, mountain scene <clears throat> underneath and uh, the lettering on the door outside and I did it. I did it all in uh, that five or six days, or six days we were there. And so I, before we went down there, the, I asked if they had a scaffolding and stuff. And they said, "Oh yeah, we got some scaffolding." Well, we got there and they didn't. So they made it out of logs, and they tied them, you know, and had these old rusty nails. And, and then there's a there was a big old plank that went across it, and it was probably it was at the bottom of that priest. So I had a, I was on my tiptoes to paint the very top of it, and my son was with me, and he was he didn't like heights, so he he was pretty scared. And then they didn't have electricity, and I knew I had to get it done, so I I took headlamps along, and uh, we were painting in the dark. We had these headlamps on, and we were painting at all times, but we got it all done. So that's the Blessed Mary and the Trinity. And that was out of their Bible, and they sent me a picture of their Bible, and that's our patron saint, Pablo or something. Okay, this is probably one of the best one or biggest things I've done, and maybe the coolest things is uh, a couple years ago I was asked to go to Russell, Kansas. That's where Bob Dole's from, our inspector on I-70, and uh, so this this person I uh, the gal that had me do it was over in Hayes one day, and she saw this portrait I did of the guy that owned this matting this frame shop and gallery. And so they started telling her a story about me, and she wanted to know who did it. And so she calls me up and said, you want to do a mural? And this one is uh, 30 by 20, and the picture is about 18 foot tall. And it's on the, it's on the worst brick in the world. I mean, it, it had an inch. It was almost an inch deep on the, on the grout, and the brick was really, really bad. I mean, it was real rough. Okay, this shows you the other side, and it's 66 foot by uh, 20, and it's World War I, II, Vietnam, and then the Gulf War, and then the stuff underneath it pertains to that war. And uh, so you can, I'm on that scaffold up there, or on that bucket, so you can see how big those faces are. And then the other trick, I'd be up there, and I'd, I started on the, on the World War I faces, and I'd, I'd, I'd be working on them. And the whole, th the whole thing, uh, somebody asked me earlier if I, if I shoot a projector when I do it. I don't. I draw it out, and I had a, a drawing that was uh, two inches squares that equaled a foot. So it, you know, and this was 66 foot, so I had two inch squares that were 60, you know, that way and this way. And so it was all, so I grid it as I did it. And what was funny, when I got done, I was only off by six inches on the whole 66 foot. And, but I'd be painting one of these faces and I'd go, boy, I really got it. And so I'd go down off the deal and I'd look up at it and the grout was so deep it messed up the perspective on it because I was up there looking at it straight. And when I get down, I was looking at it at a different angle. And I fought those first three for like a, two or three days, and I thought, man, I really got myself into something here. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna have a lot of trouble. <laughs> but by the third day, I had it figured out finally, and then it started flying. And so I did the baseball player, that one. Here's another good shot of it. it shows you how big it is. That's me standing on the bottom with my grandkids. So it gives you an idea of the scale. And this one, this is eight by 12. I did all three of those in 41 days. And I worked every day except two. And it's done with uh, what they call a uh, mineral paint, 
which is real good for uh, raw brick or concrete because it lets it breathe. Where if you put enamel on it and it, you don't have it coated just right, it gets some water in there and it'll pop it. So it was, it was pretty cool using that. Okay, and then they called me back last year, and uh, this was a tribute to somebody at, from the town, and he had this old truck that he uh, refurbished, and uh, it's a forever stamp, and this is uh, 12 foot, I think, tall and about 8 or 10 feet wide. And I did that in, uh, I think, four days, something like that, four or five. And then I'm going to show you a few, a few of my artwork I, I I get up in the morning and I I drink coffee and I'll have a sketchbook and my uh, iPad and I'm I'm looking at artwork I collect a lot of artwork on there from other artists or I collect photos and so I'm constantly I have sketchbooks I have a ton of sketchbooks I just I just draw and paint and then I have a nice studio in the basement so I probably I probably still paint uh, and draw probably six to eight hours a day, sometimes, sometimes more. I mean, it's like, it's like I got this fantastic drug in the basement, and I got to go down and get it. <laughs> I mean, it just draws me down there, and I got to go down and, and, and scratch. <laughs> and both of these are uh, <clears throat> dry brush watercolor. And uh, these are also watercolor. I, I love doing the Indians, too. You can see how big they are with that brush sitting there. This one's a little bigger. And that's watercolor. Okay, and this is my grandson. And um, I went to a deal about Thomas Hart Benton. I don't know if everybody knows who Thomas Hart Benton is. He's from Missouri, and he did the Truman Library and all that. Well, I went to a deal his daughter did one time, and she was telling us that he did a painting of the two kids every year for their birthday. And so I thought, I'm going to do that for my grandson. And then they got a granddaughter. And so I'm doing her. And so this is different ages of, of uh, Kellen. This is a, a guy, I, uh, a reenactor. I think he's from Leavenworth. They call him Cowboy Bob or something. Okay, the one on the right is my cousin Steve. And then the guy with the blonde hair on the left is uh, a guy I saw in a bar in London and I, he had a great face and I said can I take your picture and then I uh, got his email and stuff and I, I ended up giving it to him and this is that cousin's other brother and I had him stand with it so you could see I got pretty close on it the one on the left is my dad and the one on the right is a uh, daughter of this babysitter for my my son or my grandson. Her daughter. <coughs> her daughter. <coughs> and every year I do a Santa Clauses, and uh, I probably do about ten Santa Clauses every year. And the one on the right is uh, I found a book on the Coca Cola guy that did Santa Clauses, so I I do a bunch of those. But the guy on the left was. A real guy here in Kansas City, and he was at my uh, granddaughter's birthday, and uh, I took pictures of him, and so that's a picture of him. And the guy in uh, the cowboy is from uh, uh, God. What was that movie? Uh, I can't think of it right now. <laughs> and then the Indian is I saw a bunch of Indian uh, sculptures out in, uh, in Scottsdale. This is from uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. That's a watercolor. And this particular one was probably done. Another thing I'll do is, is I have a big screen TV, and so I'll put a movie on, and I'll put it on pause when I find a nice picture, and I'll sit there and I'll draw it, and sometimes I'll paint it. And then sometimes I'll take a picture of it and save it for later too, but... Just for practice, I'll sit there and I'll do like a 20, 30 minute drawing or something. And that's from uh, Good, Bad, and the Ugly. And that's probably only about that tall. That's, uh, I think that's black uh, ink or magic marker and a white pen. 
And I, I do a lot of Clint Eastwoods. <laughs> and I love this guy too. <laughs> okay, this guy on the, the cowboy is a, a reenactor and he was playing uh, uh, one of the Confederate guys that uh, went to Lawrence and I can't think of his name now. And then the other guy is uh, from that uh, Dance with Wolves, yeah. And I do a lot of sports still. I do a lot of Chiefs. I had a lot of fun doing that. I sold both of those. They were fun. These are pretty cool ones. And then there's this, uh, this is a kid that just got, they just won the state championship at Mill Valley in, uh, in DeSoto. And then this is a friend of mine, and uh, he's a he's got a Porsche, and so I uh, he's real proud of this Porsche, and I thought it'd be kind of a fun deal for his his he's got all this memorabilia in his in his office and stuff, and uh, so I thought it'd be kind of cool to make up a fake you know uh, racing team for him, and uh, so that's what that is. So that's that's all I have, and then um, I have some other drawings if you want me to show you those. I don't know if I have time or. Yeah, okay. Anybody have any questions for Bob? Do you have a microphone now? How do you go about determining what you're going to charge your customers? Uh, that's still the hardest thing. <laughs> by the hour or the, like, the figure the wall by the hour? How many uh, when, I do a, when I do a school, uh, I kind of go by the foot. Square foot, I'll figure it up, and then I, I kind of, I kind of keep it, try to keep it pretty consistent. I'll look at my old bills and stuff, and and then I'll gradually raise it every year a little bit. But I give them a pretty good break on it, though. Those they're not that expensive. And then everything I do, I usually do a drawing of it first, and then I'll show it to them. Sometimes I only have to show them one. I'll go, I have an idea, and I'll show them the idea. And I'll go, well, if you don't like this, I can come up with some other ones. And almost nine times out of ten, they'll go, well, I like this one. And then I don't have to. <laughs> and, I've, and I've been doing them long enough, and, they, and these principals go to other schools. And so they, uh, they know what, I, what it looks like already, my work, so I don't have to prove myself to them. And then I live in Olathe, and there's 36 grade schools in Olathe, and I've done 28 of them. And uh, over the years since the 90s. And then some schools, there's a couple of schools I have eight or nine different murals in it. And then there's one school I, I have three different principals had me do stuff. So it's, it's, been, uh, it's been, the schools are real fun. It's, it's mainly grade schools. I, I hardly ever do a high school or a junior high because the, the principals in grade schools are still having fun. The junior, the junior high ones are in high school are all worried about their discipline. You, you hardly ever meet them, you know. But the grade school ones, they want to have, they want to give the kids some energy, and and they have a lot of fun with it. So, grade school ones are fun. Any other questions? Yeah. This is his granddaughter, and uh, I think it would be really cool if they have pictures, and if they could show you the pictures, and maybe have you do a portrait of their their grandfather. Okay. Yeah. In his in his uh, Santa Claus outfit, you might get with them if they have good pictures of him. <laughs> okay. It depends on how good the pictures are, so. You know. So on your interior paintings, do you use like Sherwin Williams by the gallon and quart paint or? No, I, I actually, um, I used to use enamel 
I used to use one shot enamel, and I've been around enamel so many years that it kind of gives me the, you know, heebie-jeebies anymore. And like turpentine, if I get around turpentine, boy, it, I can't even get close to it. So I, I switched the water base, and I found this this uh, mural paint that's a water base that I get from uh, Jerry's Artorama, and I use that stuff, and it, and I can even I even did that truck outside with it. It said. I could use it outside, you know. So uh, I've, I've basically gone to that. Now the backgrounds, you know, I'll, like the blue or something, I'll get a Shirley Williams on that. But I try to use, you try to use a good, a good paint. Like I'll get a pretty good Shirley Williams usually if I, if the background stuff. But for all the detail and stuff, I always use uh, this mural paint. Are you buying five gallon buckets of sun paint even? Oh uh, no! I, I buy it. I buy it in these little ones because uh, it's it's such a pain carrying the big ones, and so I, you know, and you never know how much you're going to need of it. And like I bought it, I accidentally bought two quarts of orange one time, or you know, or half gallon. It took me forever to use them, and it was starting to dry. And so I, I try to stay smaller. You probably have a real nice collection of paint. Oh yeah. Well, my joke, my joke is uh, all my clothes have paint on them or they're waiting to get paint on them. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, it'll it'll usually just be pencil, but just pencil, light. yeah. But but it's like like another another. It'll just be like a four B pencil or something like that, and then I'll just make a pencil. I should have brought some of those. I could have showed you. Uh, and then my other my other thing is I love finding sketchbooks and trying different papers. So I probably got forty sketchbooks that I haven't even touched yet. And then, but I'm always trying different stuff in them. Like I like the ones that are craft paper looking brown and, you know, a different one or white ones or, or watercolor paper. Or, you know, I just, I try all different kinds. So. Do you, do you prefer traditional art or digital art? Do it. Do you prefer traditional art or digital art? Uh, I can't do digital. I'm I'm old school. Uh, I can't I, I I don't do anything on the computer except except Google <laughs> and find pictures and I mean I can't I can't do anything. Everything I do is hand done. Uh, and 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 if I if I work from the photograph and it's got to be a tight one, like if it's a, somebody I'll, you know recognizable, I'll grid it. And so I'll, I'll do boxes on it. And then I might do X's on it so I can see exactly where the nose was, and I might break that down more. And, and uh, but no, I can't. I don't. I don't use a, a computer at all. Yes. You said you um, some of the things you did in some of the supermarkets, you made them like 17 inches tall, and then they were printed large. To right. Be, so how does it get expanded without getting blocky to keep the accuracy? Well. Uh, <coughs> uh, <clears throat> Let me get a drink. Uh, the place we were working with, the scanner they had was 17 inches tall. And and uh, I was real skeptical of it too, you know. And so the first time they did it, I looked, I checked it, you know, because I wanted to see if it was good enough. And, and uh, I was talking to the guy and he says, this was like, 10, 15 years ago, he said, well, he spent over 25000 on this on this printer, you know, but they they would blow them up to 15 foot, and they weren't, they weren't specked out or nothing. I mean, they went in pixel, and uh, it was amazing. I mean, and then they do it on the tile, too, and it was, it looked really good. <laughs> and one time, the boss got mad at him about something, so she went with another company, and they, and they, weren't as good, and they did all this tile, and it was the color was horrible. They they didn't match the colors right, 
and it was just like, you know, so it depends on the company who was doing it and stuff. And I think we were using digital niche back then, and they used to do all kinds of stuff for us. And mainly the, I would mainly do the, usually the painted ones in location were usually the liquor ones because they didn't know exactly which bottles they wanted all the time. But that was always fun. I I take a, I take the bottle and I put it on a, on the copy machine. I'd make a Xerox of it. <laughs> <laughs> then I, then I could take the bottle out there and I'd look at it too and I'd grit it and you know because they were they were nine feet tall and uh, so it was always fun especially like uh, uh, that rum bottle with the pirate on it and then the uh, the let's see what's the other one the one that's got all the little X's in the glass and stuff um, I can't think of the name of it Crown Royal or something Crown you know so those were real real tough ones to do. But that was always the challenge of it, just seeing if I could do it. Anybody else? Did you do it from like projector oven and trace it? I don't, you know, I, I, I tried using projectors one time and it, and it, and it um, they're, never, they're never true. They're always distorted somewhat. And uh, like when I worked at Acme Sign, uh, we used a projector. And we had this 55-foot wall that was 20 foot tall. And we had an electric scaffold that could go up and down. And we did the, the, the deals for the football fills for the end zones. And we would make the patterns for them. Okay, okay. So we'd make the patterns on uh, like uh, clear plastic, and we and then we cut notches in it, and they'd take it out on the field, and they'd lay it down, and they'd shoot shooting those notches, and then they'd fill it in with, you know, after that. But uh, they did a bunch of Super Bowls and a uh, bunch of those. I didn't do them actually, you know, on the field, but I made the patterns for them and stuff. But that we'd use a projector on that, but you'd always have to correct it. Because it was never quite right. Do you have any other sort of famous art, artists that inspire you? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I uh, one of the designers that one that mural, mural that's in Odessa. That's a that's a off of a Thomas Hart Benton the way it's flowing, and that was it. So I went out and studied that, you know, I went out to the Truman deal and studied that and did drawings from it and all his books, and then um, another guy that I really inspired me, especially when I was doing all the mirrors and haze, was uh, Alphonse Mucha, and he was a Czechoslovakian artist. And if you've heard of Art Nouveau, it was before Art Deco. And he was the guy that invented that. And that was a big, big one for me. And then early on, Norman Rockwell, I, I studied the hell out of him and Andrew Wyeth. Uh, and I actually had to, got to go up to Andrew Wyeth's uh, place in, in uh, uh, Maine. And, uh, but, oh man, I got, uh, well, Frederick Remington, Charlie Russell. I still study those guys. I still, I still do a copy now and then. Just, as, just, and, and, and I had a teacher one time told me, if you do a copy, you're going to pick up at least one trick. So when you copy the whole painting or the whole drawing, by doing it, you're going to pick up a couple of tricks. And they aren't, kind of, they aren't the kind of stuff that I can sit down and tell you exactly what it is or name it. But it's just it, it's in my hand now and up here, and I know how to do it the next time. And it just it's some little it's some little deal I picked up. It's just like watching somebody that's really good at woodworking, and and you don't know how to do a, a particular thing, and you watch them a couple of times and you pick it up and yeah, with that, uh, Buck, I want to, on behalf of you, I just want to say thank you. Okay. This is not very much, but our token of our appreciation. <laughs> okay, thank and, you. And uh, I just want to say thank you. It's wonderful seeing your work. Thanks. And uh, 
it, it's so cool thinking about you up in a basket or on ladders <laughs> or all that stuff doing just amazing, amazing work. So thank you very much for coming you out. You guys, I'm sure you can uh, uh, come up and talk to Buck if you have more questions. Um, I don't know if we need help. We probably need help putting away chairs, but otherwise, have a great evening and, and uh, look for your emails for opportunities to. Hey, can I to can I tell you one more involved. fast one? So, the, out at Arrowhead, the Arrowhead had to be painted, repainted the red letters and the back white background. So we got the job to do it, and so we had our crane trucks were 100 foot sticks that could extend out. So it wasn't quite long enough, so they put a 15-foot extension on it, bolted it on. And so I had a swing seat, just a wooden swing seat. And I was sitting in it, and I had a harness on and stuff I was tied in. So we, and then we had to be out away from it because they had those barricades. And so I was out like this, and I'd, I'd go this way, or the, you know, and he'd move me around. And every time he'd move me, it was like a fishing pole, and it'd go like this for about five minutes, you know, and I'd be rocking up and down. <laughs> that was a fun one. Then I stood on top of the scoreboard. <laughs>